everyone. My name is Olivia Byrne. I'm the Education and Engagement Fellow for Clark County's Department of Environment and Sustainability. We are joined by Steve and Celinda from our public services today, and they're going to share about the Southern Nevada Recycling Center, which is the largest residential recycling facility in North America. And it's actually very special to have Steve and Celinda here with us today because it is November 15th, which is America Recycling Day. So that is very exciting. Um, I will pass it on to Steve and Celinda to go over their presentation. And if you guys have any questions, please drop it in the comment section below. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are very, very honored to be a part of this presentation. And my name is Steve Orico. I am the Community Relations Manager for Republic Services here in Las Vegas, Clark County. And we're being joined also by our awesome and amazing recycling coordinator, Selena Strandberg. And she is actually the one that put together this PowerPoint. I always like to give credit where credit is due. So because of her expertise and her technical prowess, we are going to have what I think is going to be a very, very nice presentation. We'll take you through the slides. We'll explain what we've got going on on each slide and uh, add some more side note information. And then as Olivia said, afterwards, we will have time, some time for some questions and answers. So again, a uh, great point that today is America Recycles Day, so we're happy to be part of this. So Linda, anything you'd like to add before we get started? No, I'm excited to uh, get, get to the questions. Okay, so if you look on the screen right here, actually that is our recycling facility here in Southern Nevada. And sustainability in action is our, uh, our motto, I guess, if you will. That's our, our, our tagline, that's what our mission is. So we're gonna get started. So this here is if you were actually in our facility, you'd be in our learning center. And the, our recycle center, it's, as you can see, it's 110,000 square foot. So the, the battery recycling center was built in 2015. And as Olivia mentioned, it is the largest residential material recovery facility in North America. It was built with 75% reclaimed repurposed steel the building features LED lighting, low flow, low flush water fixtures, xeriscape, and 1,776 solar panels on the roof. The processing materials at that center come from Vegas Valley, Lake Havasu, Arizona, and St. George, Utah. And we do this Monday through Friday from 4 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. So Linda, anything you would like to add on this? That 1,776 solar panels we have on the roof provides us with between 15 to 20% of our electrical needs based on how fast we're running the processing center. Also, the reason that we are the largest is not because of the square footage, but with our ability to process up to 2 million pounds a day. Excellent. Now, I don't know if you heard that, but I wanna make sure everybody heard that. That was up to 2 million pounds per day. So you might wanna ask some questions about that later, but as you can imagine, 2 million pounds is a lot of material. So these are some of the acceptable recycling materials that we can accept. And we would like them loose in your curbside bin. Oftentimes people put things in plastic bags or they'll put them, well, we'll talk about the plastic bags first, right? Because you think you want to keep them clean and you don't want to dirty your container. But the point is, if they're properly handled, they wouldn't be anything dirty, right? We always like them clean, empty, and dry. So we prefer that they put loose in the container, the recycling bin. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. But the plastic bags really bind up our system. So bottles and jars, empty, clean, and dry and with the cap on, please. Now, I know some people will smash the cans, or I've seen people take the plastic water bottles and scrunch them up and then put the lid back on, to try to make them smaller to conserve space. And while we appreciate that, that really does more harm than good 
because when it's compressed, those items cannot be properly identified by our scanners as it goes through our system. And oftentimes we will miss aluminum and plastic that should go in a proper place because our scanners cannot properly identify them because of how they are compressed. Aluminum and steel tin that includes cans and bottles, again, empty, clean, and dry. Now, something that I learned through my awesome recycle coordinator, Celinda, is for a soup can or a tuna can, anything like that, where you take the lid off, after you rinse that off and dry that off, please put that back into the container. And then it doesn't really take a whole lot of effort to squeeze that container to the point just so the lid doesn't come back out. Because if the lid, like the, the top of a tuna can, for example, goes in loose like that, again, because of its size, it's so flat, it often will get misidentified and won't get flagged as being tin or metal and may not get recycled as it should. Anything to add, Celinda? When it comes to the metal cans, I always like to tell folks that if food or a beverage came out of it, we'll probably take it. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to. So like a pots and pans, bike frames, that kind of thing, while they are metal, they're not recyclable in your curbside. They have to go over to a scrap metal yard. Perfect. Thank you. So these are some of the plastic that we take. We take PET, number one, which are the water bottles. Those are, you can kind of see them in the corner here. So those are the standard water bottles that you would get. HDPE, which is high density, number two, those are your milk jugs and your detergent bottles. And PP5, which are yogurt and butter tubs. And like Selena said, if food came in it, food or drink came in it, we will probably take that. But with some butter tubs, you wanna be careful because a lot of those do have like the example I like to use is Smart Balance because it has um, a different coating, if you will, on it. It's not like a solid plastic. So it has a coating on it and anything like that is considered multi-material. It's more than one type of material. And so that right there, those types of materials would not be recyclable. And again, empty, clean and dry and with the cap on. With cardboard, we like it to be flattened. Obviously it conserves room and paper that consists of office paper, newspaper, junk mail, magazines and paperback books, things like that. Now, if you have a hardback book, if you tear the cover off, throw that, that would be considered trash. But then the papers in the book, those could be recycled uh, as well. Also, when we talk about envelopes and things like that in junk mail, if you have an envelope that has the plastic window in that, that is okay. You don't have to worry about that because as that gets processed through where it's going to uh, get processed back in paper, where that gets taken care of, that whole system will filter all the plastic out. Same thing with UPS boxes or any shipping boxes with shipping labels, things like that. That's okay. You don't have to be very diligent in having to rip all that off and throw that away. That is something that will get taken care of during the processing procedure. Celinda, anything you would like to add? Yes. So with the metal, the plastic, and the glass, there's only one label we need you to take off. The rest of them can stay on. That one label is the shrink wrap label that covers like the entire bottle, like a Gatorade bottle, body armor, or like a coffee creamer. That label is a number four, which is not one of our three that we take. Even though the bottle underneath is a one or a two, the way the optics will hit it, it, the optics will determine that it's a number four because the label's covering the whole bottle. And so we'll end up missing that bottle and it will end up going to the residual line. So we do ask that you take off the shrink wrap label that covers the whole bottle. In a perfect example of that, 
that I learned along the way is if you have like coffee mate creamer, that is a perfect example of that because that sometimes you have to actually take the top off of that bottle so you can cut the film off of that. So that's what we would ask you to do. And when we talk about shrink wrap as well, a lot of people think that that well is plastic, but if it can stretch or you can tear it, that is not considered recyclable in our market here. Same thing with candy wrappers, potato chip bags, things like that. Those are not considered recyclable items here in our market. And here, we're going to show you our Murph in action. So sit back and relax and take a look at this nice video. So I'm going to pause this right here for a second, and I'm going to see if I can kind of go back to this right here. So this here, this is where everything, when it goes through the system, it gets sorted. So we're going to go back here, actually, and we're going to kind of walk through this as if you were actually there. And I'm going to try to do it. So when you, if you look at the big pile of everything there, Everything comes in and it gets loaded and dropped off there. This front loader will then scoop everything up and it'll put it'll get put into this bin here that you see it dropping it in. And from there, it gets go, it'll start going through the system. And you can imagine, Selena, what's the number on that? How the, the volume of that or the weight of that? I know that there's something that goes in there. Oh, can't hear you. Sorry. Each one of those metered bins gives us the ability to process 35 tons an hour. We have two of those bins. So we're doing 70 tons an hour. That's a lot. And as you can see, that's something that's not going to be able to be done by hand. So I'm going to play this here again, and I'm going to stop it again. So right here, that is where, when it gets placed in the bin, it comes through there. And you would be surprised some of the items that we get. And there's a difference between recycling and wish cycling. And Selinda's so told me about some things because she works more frequently at the, at the recycle center. And there's been ropes, there's been a gun safe, there's been big giant items, things that come through there. And those are things that people wish they could recycle, but they really, really can't. And those get bound up in there, especially ropes and strings and garden hoses, things like that. You'd be surprised how often we find those in this part right here. So from here, this is our sorting line. This is the first, uh, the first place where it comes out and starts sorting. So, Selinda, would you like to touch on this? Yes. So this is our pre-sort line. Their whole job is to pull out material that could damage the, the machine. So they're not doing any actual positive sorting at this moment. They're doing a negative sort. Uh, they're pulling out what we don't want. So this is where the gun safe will be pulled off. This is where the wood pallets will be pulled off anything that could damage the machinery. Perfect, thank you. And then from this here, this is this is the place where the bags, is this the place, Selinda, this correct? Is, this is cardboard. This is where our OCC, the cardboard comes out and this is where the bags will really gunk up the right. um, steel discs. So this right here, 
And since then we've revised this since this video. So there's other wheels and, and things actually between here. And this is where the plastic bags really bind up because this is where it's going to separate the cardboard. And we have how many times a day, three or four times a day, we shut so we this have, down. Yeah, we have already built in four times a day to, to stop the machinery to go in and clean it um, already on the books. So in that way, when we do that, we have to shut the line down. We have to send one or two people up into the line, into this machine to actually manually unwrap and cut plastic bags that get in here and bind that. Because if it binds it up too much, it's not going to be able to properly sort the cardboard out. So this is very important. That's why we really don't want plastic bags in here. Now, after the card, now this here, this is our glass breaker here. And this is where it goes to. So whoops, well, this video goes a little fast, so I apologize. Uh, not quick on the on the gun here. So let's see here. So this right here, can you see it? I don't know if you hit can the little see. X. Hit the little X where the more videos are. Oh, there gotcha. You. Okay, thank you. Okay, so you want to speak about this, please? Sure. So that last screen you saw was the glass breaker. That's where all the glass is going to break. It's going to fall down underneath and everything else will roll across the top to continue on. The glass will then go into these two trammels. The, the first one is looks like the barrel with the tarp over it. There's a screen in there that allows very small pieces of glass to fall down. Everything else goes into the next trammel in the box to the left. The screen in there is two inches in size, the holes are. And so glass that's two inches or smaller will fall through there. Uh, and then everything else will be separated in the cyclone on the left-hand side. All of the labels, the tops, the corks, any kind of cap will fall out. And then the glass will continue going back into that box until we break it to be two inches in size. Thank you. Huh. That's what it looks like when it's broken down. Now but all this of this here, is everything else that went across the top of the glass. Say that again. I said what you just saw was everything else that went across the top of the glass breaker. Right. This is where obviously you can see the paper. They're pulling out everything that's not paper here. And from, oops. So what are they doing right here? We don't actually use that part anymore. Okay, so this right here, is this the plastic, of, am I not, if I'm not mistaken? So this is actually the 2D, 3D container where we're gonna want all of our containers to go over the dam and all any additional paper that may have made its way to this point will fall in front and go back into the system. That's what's going on here. Okay, so, oh, hold on. So this is, this is cool. This is the eddy current, and this is where when metal and plastic and things like that come through here and aluminum, when it gets to the end of this here, and you'll see, so I want you to everybody to watch carefully, it's, there's this eddy current, and what it does is it magnetizes for just a split second aluminum, and you will see aluminum will actually kick over the barrier there and that's how it separates that. So I wish I could do that in slow motion, but please take a look at this as we go through this and you'll watch anything that's kicking up, you'll, that, that'll be aluminum. See that? Okay, our optical sorter here. So this is where we have how many different sensors, Celinda? We have four different sets of optical um, sorters to separate out the plastics. And so what it'll do is it goes through, you'll see this light here. So depending on which one it's on and what we're looking to identify, it will actually be able to identify, for example, a milk jug. And it knows where that milk jug is on here. 
And when it gets to the optical, it identifies that and it will kick that up into where that wants that milk jug to go. And we sort this different ways so we can separate the different types of PE plastic that we want based on the optical sorter that it's on. So if you see those things jumping up, right here, this what he's doing is he's pulling out everything that sh shouldn't be in there, what we want to look for in that particular sorting line. And I, I just well, I just want to go back here and say just for this right here, when they're doing this. It, and it's really different when you're actually there, but please keep in mind that this never ends. So these people are pulling this and it's not like ha ha funny, but kind of ha ha funny because I actually have worked the line. So Linda has actually worked the line. And when you're working the line, you must always kind of keep your focus to the left or, or slightly in front of you as you're pulling out whatever it is you're sorting on that line. Because if you follow it and it goes to the right, you will get dizzy. <laughs> and you, I mean, I got dizzy a couple of times because you're grabbing this and you're trying to grab it and sort it and trying to keep up. And it's just natural sometimes you see one item, you say, oh, I'm going to get that item. And then it goes past you and you're trying to grab that. And it made me very wobbly. I know, Celinda, you've experienced that as well. Yeah. And it's it's a terrible feeling, <laughs> it's, but it, it's part of it. And so, you know, hats off to our, our men and women that do this on a daily basis uh, to help keep um, our, our world better. So you want to talk about this here with the bales, please, Celinda? Sure. So the first baler we saw is our cardboard uh, baler and paper baler. Uh, it can actually make a new bale every three and a half minutes. We have the ability to make a bale every three and a half minutes on that particular baler. It's an open end baler. The second baler we saw, which I think was for the plastics, that is a two ram baler. Takes it a little longer to make it, but we have two of those and they take care of our metals and our plastics. Now, at this point, I just want to kind of mention a little side note that if, 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 if you're all familiar with the size of our trucks, all right, our recycle trucks, we can process, from, and correct me if I'm wrong, but we can process the entire inside of that truck. It'll go through our entire line in two and a half minutes, if yes. I'm not mistaken, two and a half minutes. So we can take eight to 10 tons of material and run that through our entire process in two and a half minutes. And then, as Salim said, this is the end product. This is where it gets bailed. And from here it gets stored. Okay. So everything is run automatically. We have supervisors and managers that actually have iPads and uh, they will go through and they can control this. They can slow the line down if need to be. They can speed it up if need to be. If there's an issue with something like we talked about getting stuck in one of the sorting areas we they can actually stop this just by hand so very state-of-the-art and it also makes it very safe because they all have radios and if they hear anything hey we need to slow this down we need to take a look at this this is something that they have access to they walk around with these throughout the facility and this is what you would see if you were in the learning center and that's us. Anything you would like to add to this, Celinda, before we go to the next slide? Uh, no, I think we covered it all. Okay, so hold on. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. So these are what's not acceptable as recyclable here in our market. Like we spoke about flexible plastics. That's the plastic bags, wraps, film, no cartons. Uh, 
that's like the multi-material like broth and soup and milk because those are multi-materials they usually have a wax coating on those so linda spoke to no scrap metals bike frames engine parts gun safes and you'd be surprised rubber tires you'd be surprised we actually get that more often than you would think uh, no scrap wood or other construction debris and i think in a market this probably is one of the things that comes up the most because a lot of people relocate to Las Vegas from other areas where wood is considered recyclable because they use that to mix and to make that for mulch and things like that. But again, we're specifically speaking to what is and is not recyclable in our market here. So scrap wood and other construction is not recyclable. No organics, food or yard waste. Obviously, no bathroom waste, things like that. Um, tissue is not recyclable, even though it's a paper product. That's kind of at the end of its life cycle. So that is also going to be garbage. So please keep that in mind. And at the beginning, Selena was talking about 2 million pounds a day is what we're capable of doing, which is 1,000 tons a day. Right now, we are processing about 600 to 800 tons a day. And the reason for that is all the contamination that we get from that, that goes through there. Like we talked about all the wish cycling. So there's a lot of wish cycle that's going on out there. And that's one of the things that Linda and I are tasked with the most. Uh, that's one of my main focuses is education in our community. And so Linda has been a tremendous assistant, a tremendous uh, help with that, assisting me with that, because the more we can get the contamination down, the closer to that 1,000 tons we can get, and that just makes it better for everybody. Again, I am Steve Rico. I am the manager of community relations. This is my cell number. This is my email. If you would like to schedule a tour for yourself or for some colleagues or for your family, you can set that up through Recycle Vegas at republicservices.com. And Selena would be more than happy to go ahead and schedule a tour with you. And for more tips and resources, please go to recyclingsimplified.com. And there you'll see a whole list of different items we have. We have education for schools. There's lots of other fun videos on there. There's lots of different tips that you can get about recycling from that website. And that will do it. All right, so, thank you so much for, thank you. for sharing about how we're tackling waste here in the Vegas Valley and also a little bit beyond. Um, but now, if you guys have time, I'll ask you some questions. Okay. Absolutely. Great. All right. So the first commenter said that it's hard for them to imagine residential folks stop putting recyclables in plastic bags. Is there a way we can overcome this technical challenge? Of the of not putting, I'm sorry, as put like being able to put them in bags. Yeah, or stopping informing people that it shouldn't be in bags. Well, oh. informing people that's bad, that's part of educating the community. And one of the best ways to do that, to be quite honest with you, is we tell you, you tell somebody else, they tell somebody else, and they get that message around. Now, we do do scheduled advertising here locally, and we do go out into the community. We do different events, like... Uh, we did at um, Ecotopia to pass the message out, things like that. And there's probably 12 to 15 or more events a year that we attend and we participate in to get that message across. And again, everything is pretty much based on what is recyclable in, in the market. Now, when our recycle center first opened up, you we had a place for the bags. And if you saw in the video, they were grabbing things and putting them up and it was getting sucked up into like a vacuum kind of thing. 
we used to have that and it would go to a certain part of the recycle center and it was like we called it our sausage maker because so we would take all those plastic bags and would fill that up and when it got to a certain length it would be cut off and it would be stored and it would be shipped off again it's based on what is recyclable in the market so currently those types of plastics are not considered recyclable so that's why we don't recycle them and the best way like i said is is just you know, you've heard it before, like tell a friend kind of thing, because that's really the best, right? You're hearing it from Celinda and I, Celinda and me, right? You're hearing it from us. So now you take that and you spread that message as well. Right. Yeah, that's good. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I didn't know that it, we used to uh, be able to handle the plastic bag recycling. So that's Good, so hopefully it'll come back in the market again. Hope so. All right, next question is, will there be a fee or warning program implemented for those who put non-recyclables in the curbside bin? Um, they put an example here that cities in Arizona put a rat, red tab on recycling cans um, if the resident put a wrong item. Oh, you want me to oh. take that one? Sure. So we had the, the oops ticket project that was going on a few years back where people would get oops stickers on their on their bins the way our contract is set up with the city though we are not able to fine anybody so there'll be no monetary fine if they continue to contaminate their bin however we do have the option of pulling their bin so if their bin is constantly contaminated we can take away their recycling bin so that they only have a trash can now, and to follow up on, thank you for that, Selena. Um, in some other markets, like perhaps some places in Arizona, California, Oregon, things like that, where recycling is mandated and it's mandatory by the city or by the county, oftentimes it's those entities that are putting those stickers on and that are uh, fining those people. So that is something that, like Selena said, that's not something that we do here. Recycling is not mandatory. It's an option here. And some of you might be thinking, okay, well, how do you know where that recycling came from? How do you know that this is the one that's constantly being contaminated? Trust us when we tell you, we can find it. It, it boggles my brain sometimes as well uh, that we can actually track back. And it's not like by going through the, the address, you know, we don't go digging through, but every, every route, everything is documented. And oftentimes a driver also will notate that this, this certain container is constantly being contaminated. So we have checks and balances within our system ourselves to go back and track and say, okay, we know it's you, no more recycle. Okay, great. Are there plans to handle organic waste and composting at this facility? Not at this facility. That's a total other animal uh, for composting, things like that. Um, that's something that we've discussed internally as a company um, from locally all the way up to corporate and things like that. Um, Las Vegas, Clark County, we're not a big farm or agricultural uh, area. So as, as good as composting is, there are other the other facilities and other entities that do do composting. Um, right now, it's not something that we are going to venture into, but it's always everything with us, anything that has to do with eco-friendly and environmental friendly, it's always a discussion. Just so you know, I mean, whenever it gets to a point where it makes sense to do it for our community and for the entities involved, because there's a cost to everything, right? And so not only do we incur the cost, but the county incurs the cost, things like that. So it's never off the table, but it's nothing that's gonna happen in the immediate future. Thank you. I just have a few more questions. This one says, what are some items that look recyclable, but are not accepted at this facility? Uh, so Linda touched on that, but I'll let her go ahead and jump on this because she sees this every day. I do. So a lot of it is going to be your plastics. Um, 
plastics all have that chasing arrow symbol on them. Uh, it does not mean that they're recyclable. Only the plastics that are recyclable at your facility are actually recyclable in your curbside. So like we have uh, plastics number six out there that are recyclable some places, but not here. The other one is size. We have size uh, requirements. So like a number five, we can take your cold McDonald's drink or your Dutch Bros or your Starbucks drinks because they're number fives, but we can't take a five gallon bucket, even though it's also a number five. It's too large to get through the system. As you saw in the video, our system is, because it's a residential system, it's set up for mainly residential material. So anything that is large is not gonna be able to make it through the system. So we see a lot of that. As with glass, folks like to put in their dishware or their cookware or their bakeware or a broken window or something like that. And while that is glass, because it's coated or it's tempered, it's gonna create bubbles when melted with your wine bottles and your liquor bottles. So when they go to make a new pickle jar, those bubbles will burst under pressure. So there's certain types, even though it's all glass, it's not all coated in, in a way that our manufacturer can accept it. And I wanna interject as well. And this gets back to our education of, of educating the community because I, I'd rather address this before it comes, it, before someone has to ask this question. If you own a home and you have the home recycle container, right? On there, on most of them, there's a sticker and it'll say what's acceptable. Unfortunately, those were done a while back and a lot of these containers have been out by when we started this recycling program and you'll see the milk container, it'll say is acceptable. And that's part of our challenge, right? Is educating the community. And we're saying on one hand, this is recyclable. And then on the other hand, well, it's really not. Well, for sheer, just the sheer numbers of it, you know, we're not gonna print out 300,000 or 350,000 new stickers and go out there and do that, right? I mean, in a perfect world, we would do that. So that's where education becomes very, very important. And that's why we, we try to be as accessible as we can. You know, that's why my personal email, well, my, my work personal email is on there. That's why we, you know, you can reach out to us through Insta Salinda, through Recycle Vegas. Because if you have questions, if you're saying, okay, well, it says this, but somebody's telling me this, just please ask us and, and we'll give you the, the, the right answer. And again, it's part of the education. So sometimes, it's not a perfect world as much as we try to make it one. So just, just be mindful of that, please. Absolutely. Well said, Steve. Thank you. All right. The last question, I think we did touch up on it during your presentation a little bit. Um, are mixed materials okay if the materials are connected? So, so I'll, I'll take that one for you, Steve. So yeah. as you can tell through the video, we separate items by one type of material. So anything that is a mixture of materials, kind of like those milk cartons where it's paper, then there's wax on it, there's an aluminum layer in there as well as a plastic spout. Too many materials at one time. We do not separate, we sort. So that's why I like to tell everybody, we sort your material, we don't separate out the material. That's why we have to take the hard cover off of a hardback book. We can recycle either the top or the inside, but we can't recycle them when they're together. They have to be separate individual materials. And also to follow up on that, because something they brought up is because I've seen this done where, you know, for the sake of conserving space, you'll take something and put it inside something else, right? You'll take a, a small bottle and put it inside a bigger bottle where you'll take five boxes and kind of stick them all in together and then you know to save space and we get that but uh, we ask that you don't do that you know that's what we talked about like with cardboard flatten it down if you flatten the, the cardboard down and put it in the container that'll save a lot more room than it would if you just put everything in one box and stuck it in the bin because when you start doing that it's it's sometimes it is harder to sort and sometimes it won't get sorted properly 
great. Thank you so much, you guys. That was all the questions that um, we had for today. It's very fascinating to learn more about the facility and what we can and cannot recycle here. Um, I know it's a very extensive process and it's a little bit hard to wrap our head around every single type of material, uh, but you guys are making it more easier for us than sharing the do's and don'ts. So we really appreciate it. Um, if there's any more questions that come up, I'll for sure get those over to you guys. Uh, but that is about it, unless you guys have anything else you'd like to share. So Linda, I'll let you, do you have anything I just, else? I just wanna say thank you for having us today. Um, hopefully we can do this again. I enjoyed it and always getting the word out. It's part of my uh, job. It's my favorite part of my job is to talk to people to talk about recycling and what the do's and don'ts are, are for this particular area. I, and I echo that um, absolutely. And please keep in mind too that if you're not able to come to the recycling facility, I know this was kind of set up like we talked about earlier, like a lunch and learn kind of thing because it's during the lunch hour. Um, we also are available to come to you. You know, if there's more people in the office that maybe they'll watch this video, but if they'd like that personal interaction and have questions, things like that, uh, please reach out to us and we'd be more than happy to set up um, us coming to you and having some discussions at, at your places of business. Absolutely. Thank you. And again, thank you. I'm sorry. And, and thank you for having us. Uh, we're always honored and, and, and thankful when we get the opportunity to, to do this.